Um, you want to uh, be able to look out for confusion that may, in fact, be very reversible uh, in that market. So should you just give them B12? Anybody? I would just give them B12. Anybody in the bed corner? No, if they were deficient. Because not everybody, the relative risk is only about 2.5. So, you know, it, 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 it happens. I would make sure that I, um, if there were a cognitive decline, I would work them up. But I would also probably, you know, check CBCs periodically on patients on that one. Okay? Well, how long does it take to? <clears throat> they tend to be on it a long time. So it's not something that happens right away. Because remember, what's happening is the metformin is actually inhibiting absorption. Remember in an earlier slide, I talked about how we have an enterohepatic circulation. So if you're of normal B12 and I'm inhibiting your absorption today, it's going to take, you know, eight to ten years. So these are patients who are on the drug for a long time, okay? We're going to talk about another class of drugs where this happens, and that's the PBI. So when the proton pump inhibitors were first um, approved, and they were not approved for long-term use and still are not approved for long-term use. But the number of patients I see either in the hospital or in the outpatient setting that are on PPIs, who really are on PPIs for no good reason, we're now starting to see B12 deficiency in those patients as well. Not surprisingly, because remember the biochemistry I showed you in the beginning, we need an acid environment um, uh, to a facilitate release of B12 from foodstuffs, but also uh, it's an important part of B12 metabolism. So if we're blocking acid production, we're going to block B12 um, release from foodstuffs and subsequent absorption. Um, there's an impaired conversion of pepsin into peps pepsin, and H2 blockers can do this as well. But because um, they don't block acid quite as well as the PPIs, it's a little less common than the H2 blockers. But um, think about this in your patients on H2 blockers, that this is something we're starting to see. I remember when the drugs first came out, and we hematologists would say, you know, I wonder if we're going to see B12 deficiency. We were sure, oh, no, because no one's going to be on them that long. Well, guess what? People are on them forever for no good reason, and now we're starting to see B12 deficiency. Case. A 64-year-old woman with a history of heavy alcohol use presents to our internist complaining of numbness and tingling in her hands and feet for the past six months. She reports a fall a month ago that resulted in an ER visit uh, and a laceration to her forehead. She's a positive romber. She's anemic with a hemoglobin of 8.4. She's macrocytic. She's found of a serum folate of 3, which is low, and a serum B12 of 213, which is that low normal range. She's given supplemental folate with resolution of her anemia, but her neurologic symptoms continue to worsen. Why? And we talked about this. And this is because folic acid can improve the anemia in B12 deficiency, but not the neurocognitive findings. So um, <laughs> even with B12 deplacement, again, in patients who uh, are B12 deficient, only half have a complete neurologic recovery and 6% of residual long-term severe neurologic uh, disability. So that's what we're talking about. So if you have a patient who's B12 deficient, you want to replace B12. Not all of them get completely better, and some of them don't get much better at all. But clearly, if you don't replace it, they're going to have progressive decline. The other important thing is folic acid deficiency can mask B12 deficiency because if you correct it, the anemia improves. So make sure that you can uh, dis distinguish the two. Now, one way that I use to distinguish the two, and I should probably have a slide here about that, is that if you're folic acid deficient, serum folates aren't great tests either, but your homocysteine is elevated, but not your MMA. So again, with B12 <coughs> deficiency, the MMA and homocysteine are increased. With folic acid deficiency, just the homocysteine uh, increase. So that can sometimes be a help. That's why I send MMAs in my patients who have a macrocytic uh, anemia that's unexplained. The neurotoxicity, again, is a subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord um, in this area up here. Uh, in 1926, Mino and Murphy received the Nobel Prize. Pernicious anemia at the time, uh, for hematologists, when you look at the marrow, they're either beautiful or scary. They're beautiful because of their colors, but they're scary because this looks like an acute leukemia. And we see patients sometimes with this diagnosis as acute leukemia. Uh, who actually have B12 deficiency because of this incredible B12 deficiency causes an incredible alteration in the hemat in hematopoiesis. See lots of abnormal cells. Um, in 1926, Minot um, and Murphy received the Nobel Prize because they were able to correct 
pernicious anemia, which looked like a leukemia with liver extract. So this was really an astounding finding. Um, again, what happens is methionine is needed um, uh, for um, myelin, um, uh, for the production of myelin. Um, and what happens when you're B12 deficient is um, you don't convert homocysteine into thionine. Um, so what happens is your homocysteine levels go up. Homocysteine itself is neurotoxic, and you're not making the thionine. So you really get a double whammy with B12 deficiency to cause this neurologic um, deterioration. Uh, then MMA, which also goes up, also destabilizes myelin. So it's actually a triple hit. Okay? So in patients who um, are B12 deficient, you've got to fix uh, their B12 so to prevent really this toxicity. Okay. A seven-year-old boy presents with severe B12 deficiency, accompanied by pancytopenias and developmental delay. He eats a normal diet. He has an uncle who has a similar history. So you know now you're learning a little bit. This sounds congenital, right? And not surprisingly, this is a rare disease, but if you understand what I told you about the biochemistry, there are patients who genetically have an abnormality in the B12 receptor, right? And who cares when it's called Emerson Gray's bucket? I only put, point this out as this is one disease, as rare as it is, where these patients are absolutely going to need perennial B12, right? But the number of people who need perennial B12 is vanishingly small. Okay. A 42-year-old man from Scandinavia presents with severe B12 deficiency accompanied by pancytopenia and ataxia. He eats a fish-based diet. So this is everyone's favorite cause of B12 deficiency. Call it out, somebody. Fish tapeworm, yes. Right? So here's a picture. I put some sushi there on the, on the left so you can see. But these guys can get as long as 33 feet, and they're confined to the intestine. And these guys actually have receptors for B12. Um, uh, on their surface, and they compete with the host, and you can use anti-helminthic um, antibiotics to actually get rid of these, but fish tapeworm does this. The other, um, you know, sort of classic description is um, uh, gefilte fish uh, makers, um, where they use raw fish, but uh, if you eat raw fish, you can in fact get this and become B12 deficient and have these 33-foot worms in your, yeah. A 32-year-old woman with a 20-year history of scleroderma presents with severe B12 deficiency, <clears throat> complicated by neuropsychiatric disturbances. She has a history of diarrhea that can be severe, requiring hospitalization. So why is she B12 deficient? So an etiology I don't want us to forget about is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So what happens is you get, if you have decreased motility, B12 is taken up by the bacteria uh, in the intestine. It's metabolized to inactive analogs. Um, and um, these patients actually don't absorb, don't, they, they destroy their B12 before it can be uh, absorbed. A lactulose breath test can sometimes uh, be diagnostic, and these patients are treated with antibiotics, which brings me to some old uh, news, and that's the Schilling's test. Who in this room has ever done one? Oh, come on, Walter, you must have done one in charity. Everyone's done one in charity, right? Okay. Okay? Uh, uh, yeah. You've done one, right? There's no reason to do them anymore, but. You know, we used to do these, and, and what we used to do, and for the younger folks, this is kind of history, but um, we used to give patients oral radioactive B12. We actually did this, right? And then what we did is we gave IM non-radioactive B12 to sort of saturate the binding program, proteins and uh, uh, to flush out um, uh, radioactive B12. And then what we did is we collected radioactive urine for 24 hours, right? So you collect this radioactive urine. Normal person excretes about 10% of the radioactive dose, um, but if you don't excrete that, right, then the question is you're not absorbing it, so it's not getting into your urine. So we repeated the showing test with oral hog intrinsic factor. So now you're given radioactive B12 and hog intrinsic factor, you're collecting radioactive urine to see if it's absorbed. And if that didn't work, then we gave pancreatic enzymes, because remember, if you didn't, um, if you don't make, a, a, if you're not alkaline, then you can't bind the intrinsic factor, so we solved that, corrected it. And then, if that didn't work, we gave antibiotics to look for bacterial overgrowth. So there were four parts of the Schilling's test. There's radioactive urine all over the hospital. So the long and short of it is, is you know, we don't do this anymore, right? But this was of some historical interest because we wanted to find out why patients were B12 deficient. Turns out, those were the days of inquiry, right? Where we had house staff labs and you know, we dipped our own urine and did lots of things. Um, but if the treatment's B12 and oral B12, 
you know, this academic exercise puts people at risk, and there's probably not a reason. Not probably, there is no reason to do these anymore. Okay. A 28-year-old, slight shift in gear with this one. A 28-year-old chemistry graduate student is brought into the ED complaining of nausea, vomiting, headaches, and shortness of breath. On exam, he has red appearing skin. He found a heart rate of 110. He admits to ingesting potassium cyanide. He develops hypertension and he's given hydroxycobalamin and has a complete recovery. So one of the real uses of um, B12 is the treatment of cyanide toxicity. And the way it works is cyanide actually binds to trivalent um, iron. Uh, and arrests oxidative phosphorylation and forces <laughs> cells into anaerobic um, metabolism and causes venous hyperoxia. That's why they appear red. Uh, and if you remember some of the some of what I showed you um, earlier with the biochemistry, hydroxocobalamin has a hydroxyl group in the middle of this tetrahydroperol uh, uh, structure, and cyanocobalamin has cyanide in that position. So if we give hydroxocobalamin, it actually acts as a sponge to soak up cyanide. So it's actually a very, very useful antidote and one that's frequently used now. So I, I like to look at the literature of other weird things that we're going to conclude with these, other weird things B12 deficiency can do. So um, there's a, 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 a report in the, in the Journal of Psychiatry of all places, but um, saying that a patient um, had graying of the hair unexpectedly. He was a young man. He was found to be profoundly B12 deficient, got B12 in his hair color chain. Walter, there's hope for you. But anyway, um, I don't know if that's true. true. Am true. I the only person you know? No, I <laughs> true, 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 and unrelated, but in fact, um, a real thing. So we know that you know, patients with B12 deficiency get a, get a big tongue, as demonstrated here mostly on, on the left. And you know, we didn't talk about thrombotic thrombocytic pain of purpura in this talk, but this was a case from um, uh, our place where the patient actually had red cells that looked fragmented, and this was misconstrued as thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. But if you look at the poly, there's no way this is TTP. It's just got to be B12 deficiency. And the red cells look funny because there's ineffective erythropoiesis. They need the B12 to, for normal um, uh, maturation. This is one of the coolest things that you can see. I've seen this this time. I think I took a picture of it. Um, this is called a catagrin. And with severe B12 deficiency, you get um, some uh, uh, retention of the mitotic spindle in red cells. So, you know, rare, rare family, but kind of cool when you see it. So some pearls. Elevated MMA and serum homocysteine are really the test you want to do for B12 deficiency. Forget serum B12. Replace B12 by mouth, unless you don't have an ileum. Okay? Check for B12 deficiency and folate deficiency. Remember, there's really not a reason to give B12 outside of deficiency. There are some rare causes. An elevated B12 deserves evaluation. Uh, B12 is now an antidote for cyanide poisoning. And with that, I thank you wholeheartedly for your time and attention. Thank you. I have a few minutes for questions. Yes? Questions, yes. Um, other than the cost, is there any difference between oral and parenteral as far as efficacy? Some studies show the oral is better, has better efficacy. Some of that may be related to compliance, but some show that there is actually better efficacy. But the cost and the convenience really outweigh anything else. Yes. The, the second question, the corollary is, if, if as you mentioned twice, B12 actually stores last eight to ten years, Yeah. Is the if you give um, B12 shot every ten years, that's not really cost ineffective and if you do that, but I don't see people doing that. I see them getting B12 every week, every two weeks, every month, and that's where it becomes ridiculous. Yes, if you give one shot and, and you do that for 10 years, yeah, you're probably cost effective. And in fact, you know, true confession, I see somebody profoundly B12 deficient with mental status changes, I'm going to give them one parenteral dose, right, just to make sure they get it. I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to watch for hypokalemia, because those are the patients that get that. Other questions? Yes.